Hello and welcome to the Pots and Trowels podcast. I'm Martin Fish and joined by Sean Hello. and by Jill. Hi. And this week I'm going to be talking to Barry Proctor to find out how he transitioned from agriculture to horticulture and also getting a few ideas of what he's going to be doing at the Chelsea Flower Show in a few weeks' time. Oh, it's getting exciting. Uh, so there are some jobs for you to be getting on with. Well, I say you, but me as well, because there's plenty of hoeing to do in the garden <laughs> and then some things to sow in the greenhouse as well. And we'll be answering a couple of uh, listeners and viewers questions because of course we do our weekly videos on YouTube as well as the weekly podcast um, about fuchsia but first let's hear from Barry Barry, you've got an established nursery, very well known on the show circuit, but horticulture hasn't been your only career. So how did it all start? What did you do first and how did you get into horticulture? Well, it started, we were sort of dairy farmers at heart. That's what the family was. So um, I started growing plants on the side from a very young age of about seven or eight, growing veg and things like that, and then progressed into cut flowers for sale with my vegetables and then progressed into plants. Um, I brought my first polytunnel when I was 14, helped by my uncle. And then um, on my first two weeks wages, I brought my first sort of glass house. I brought two 8x6s and joined them together to give me an 8 by 16 <laughs> and um, it sort of carried on. That's what it did. And I was in and out of growing plants sort of for at least 14, 15 years until I was about 30. And then, um, the decision was made to do horticulture sort of full time and then I got my first sort of award in 2000 um, just really putting plants out to make them look pretty and sort of catch people's eye and then I think it was 2008 when I decided to do Tatton for the first time and then um, we got quite a lot of compliments from the judges in the plant village of on design and mm -hmm. things as plant quality let it down because I didn't really grow for the show. I sort of said I'm going to take what I've got and reinvest what we took from the show and that's what we did and ever since then we've been sort of on the show circuit and now we do sort of around 30 shows a year. Right yeah so you are very busy through the season. We so are. going back a little bit then so you've obviously always gardened and grown things but yes. you know for a long time you were dairy farmer. Yes. We so were, when yeah. you did make that decision when you were sort of in your 30s that would be quite a big decision because you'd grown up with farming yes is, is, is it three generations of your family yeah, have been yeah. farmers three so, to four generations yeah. yes so yes. you know was that something that took quite a while to make that decision or did you just have that light bulb moment and think well actually i don't want to farm anymore i want to be a grower of plants that decision was probably took over about two years it was um a very hard decision because we spent 14, 15 years building the business up and making the sheds and all the buildings and the farm viable for the next generation. Um, so you don't make that decision very lightly. It was quite hard, but the job had changed a lot and it was moving forward at a rapid pace. And my biggest issue was probably the older generation didn't want to go with that sort of pace. So mm -hmm. I knew where I got to be, but the older generation didn't want to go down that way. So um, rather than fight, I sort of changed direction onto the plants and did the plants full time. And with discussions with my uncle, who was in sort of partnership farming, he says, you haven't got to milk these cows, Barry. So, um, so yeah, it took sort of two years to wind it down, but we wind it down and my uncle had a good retirement and he watched me build the business up and he couldn't have been a prouder man. Yeah, I mean, it would have been lovely for him to see you doing that. And, yeah. and do you now, you know, quite a long time on from that point and you've got a very established and successful nursery business, do you sometimes think, oh, wouldn't it be nice to have a few cows in the field or have you sort of gone beyond that completely? we sort of gone beyond that, but the next generation, my son and daughter are both farming mad. So um, my daughter's just passed a national diploma or MVQ in, it's RAB. Basically, she's a farming um, estate agent. Um, I mean, I wish I could remember the word, she'll go mad with me. So she passed out last year. So and that, got, is that like a land agent? Kind yeah, of thing? it's like yeah. a land agent and she advises farmers on the new policies and schemes that are coming along right. and farming incentives and she really loves it. She's got her own flock of sheep as well, which her and her brother we're doing together, but 
now I've given Isabel the sheep to go farm with a boyfriend right. and my son's farming on the farm with the um, he's farming fat cattle now so right, okay. it's still there yeah yes which is good in a way isn't it when it's been in your yes. family for a yeah, while but definitely so. so so the nursery um you're in uh Staffordshire yeah we're in the um, hills of Staffordshire and yes. you 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 the nursery covers, I think, 40-odd acres, isn't it? Yeah, it's about 45 acres in total on about four sites. So we've got about... It's a seven-acre pot production site, which was about four acres of plastic on and, and two glass houses and quite a lot of standing-out space, about another four-acre standing-out space. Right. So, um, But you think when you pack your tunnels full and pack them in pot thick, you've got to actually put them outside and give them some space to grow. So... Yeah. Um, it's a big area when it's all full and sort of mid-June, so it's, yeah. And, and you're doing an awful lot of perennials. You do other things as well, shrubs and fruit, but I suppose the, the lion's share of what you're growing is perennials to take to the flower shows yeah, and plant fairs. Yeah, yeah perennials are our sort of passion mainstay, as you would say. It's, um, it's what we seem to be able to grow and sort of do really well. It's, so that's what... That's what we do. I don't sort of like changing too much from what I'm good at, and um, we seem to have the knack with perennials, and yeah, we seem to just enjoy it and get it right, so we keep sort of sticking at it. Yeah, and, and you've always got a good range of them as well. When I see you at the shows, when I, you know, pretty much every show I go to, you're there, Barry, and you have been for the last number of years. Yes. You've got a good range, um, and because you're being at shows from you know sort of April right the way through until the end of September it must be like a continuous production line presumably yeah it, yeah it really is I mean we do a lot of sewing and cuttings and splitting as well so yeah we always try and keep the batches coming through so we don't just pot one batch of perennials mm. we split them by about every three to six weeks just depending and then you know some of the stuff we pot at the end of May that makes a big plant for the autumn so it's um, and perennials to sort of do what they do you know they'll keep growing and doing well so yeah it is continuous and we keep it raked up but it keeps it fresh as well yeah but it must be quite difficult because i suppose you've got to sit down probably with your production team at some point well, i don't when you do it obviously months in advance and think how much are we going to grow so you because you can't run out for a flower show can you but you no. don't want millions of plants spare at the end of the season yeah it's a very tough sort of balancing act of getting that right I tend to not grow more than 500 in a batch now um, mm. then it keeps it moving in and out so yeah that it's a lot of thinking yeah and on my behalf I do a lot of the planning and I don't always get it right sometimes no. we get it wrong but um, and, and I suppose trends change don't they what might be popular one year two or three years down the line Everybody's got that, so yeah. they're looking for something new. And, and one of the things you try to do is always get something new in, don't you? Always try to get the new plants. I've sort of got quite a good friend who sort of deals with a lot of the um, breeders and things and bring things to market. So it's quite a big business there. But I'm not sort of on that forefront like Thomas and Morgan and Hayloft. But we do get some good plants sort of, sort of pushed our way. I mean, the typical example being Salvia Amistad. Um, I was given that many, many years ago, probably 10 years ago now, and it's sort of, it's almost in everybody's garden. Mm. It's a plant which flowers and always pleases. Yeah, and it just goes on and, and on. It goes on and on. on, yeah. So what about, you know, here we are, um, we're at Harlow Cart at the moment, we're, you know, third week in April, um, and you've got some wonderful perennials on the stand, and I know if I see you in another month, it will be a different range, but have you any ideas what you think is going to be popular this year? What if it's got to be, I must get that plant. Sometimes that depends on the weather as well, <clears throat> and just when everyone's in the garden. But I think phylicterums could be strong this year. They're bringing quite a few good acolegian forms out. There's little, little pinky and, and what's the other one? I mean, the splendid and splendid white are always good, and black stockings. But your splendid white and splendid come later, and your little yeah. pixie and black stockings come in the spring, which like an acolegian. Acolegia folium form, yeah. which are really good for this time of year, and one called sort of thundercloud. 
Right, yeah, and they are lovely, aren't they? And they just give some height and structure. Yes. You've got a plant I've seen on the stand as well. I, I like euphorbias. Uh, Mrs. Fish isn't quite so keen on euphorbias, but it's got a really, really dark foliage. I think it's called Miner's Merlot. Miner's Merlot, Miner, yeah. As in a coal miner's yeah. spell, isn't it? It uh, is, with yeah. An ER. Um, I mean, is that is that new? Because I haven't seen that before. Yeah, that's a new one this year. It's a cross between a polychroma and an amagrom gromies, I think the word yeah. the, the right sort of wording is and the um, the call is very intense and apparently the brats go on for a little bit longer so oh, um and but, not a huge one is it, it no it's like not a at all one. one yeah it's nice and compact and yeah. fits the pots and small garden type of thing so i'm assuming things like that if they're new they'll have is it called plant breeders rights yes they've so, got plant breeders rights on which rightly so it gives the breeders the funding to keep breeding the plants because yeah. they grab a lot of seedlings and do a lot of work finding these new plants so I think they should be rewarded for what they do. Absolutely, otherwise yeah. they're not going to carry no, on. No, that's so not going to carry on. That's right. So no, it's and it's good to have new things because I think everybody's always looking for something a little bit different in the garden, yeah. something a bit more unusual. Definitely so and I tend to bring a lot of novelties back in about four or five years after they've been brought out yeah. um, because you have the big phase where the big companies have them and then they sort of disappear a little bit so then I ask for them to be put back in production and bring them back and it's amazing how how well they sell at times yeah yeah because people have got them in the garden and they've done well but they can't actually buy them so the friends then want them so it's sort of yeah you've got to just keep changing it around and mix yeah, it up and, exactly and not yeah. be stale no you know. exactly that's right now we've got to talk about exhibiting at the flower shows and last year was your very first Chelsea flower show so uh, we're going to take a little break now but can we have a chat about your exhibits at the Chelsea flower show we in a minute? Can. I'd love to. Oh, I'm looking forward to hearing about behind the scenes with the Chelsea exhibitor mm. in the next part. That's going to be fantastic. Um, there's something that I, I picked up on that, that you chatted about that I wondered about. What what are plant breeders' rights? Mm, good good question. That is, um, it's when uh, new plants are bred. So there are there are big nurseries, commercial nurseries out there in the world, and they do lots and lots of plant breeding and introduce all these lovely new varieties and new cultivars, new colours and different types of plants. And obviously there's a lot of time spent doing that and a lot of expense. You know, it can take several years to develop a new plant. So once they've developed it, they mm. hold the plant breeders' rights. It's a bit like a copyright, essentially. And it usually lasts for a number okay. of years. And it, what it means is if... Barry or any nursery wants to grow this particular plant that's been bred and recently introduced, Barry can't buy a plant and take cuttings off it and sell those cuttings um, for, um, for financial mm. reward. So he has to buy in the plants that have been grown commercially on nurseries all over the world uh, as plug plants, but they pay a royalty. So it'll be the cost of the plug plant yeah. plus a royalty. And that royalty goes back to the plant breeders uh, so they can fund more work. And it normally lasts for a number of years. Okay. Um, from the general public point of view, if you buy one of these plants and it's got plant breeders' rights on it, and it will usually say on the label um, PBR, mm then you can take a cutting of it at home. So if you bought one, Sean, and you wanted another one, you could take a cutting and grow it for yourself. Yeah. But it's, which is totally legal, it's if you then decided to put it outside your house saying for sale, then it is illegal. So you can do it for your own yes. use, but you can't do it for commercial growing. So does the plant breeder right. pay to have that right? They they have to pay to register right. it. So it costs okay. them not only a lot of money to breed the plants in mm. the first place, but then they have to pay to have that registered and have the, the royalty on it. But then all the royalties of that go back to them. Mm. So if you have found a new plant or you've created a new plant how long is it before you can market it well normally they will be trialed so once they've developed that new plant they'll then be grown and trialed for a number of years to make mm. sure they're stable because sometimes they can revert back or yeah. change or mutate so you've got to get them to a stable position so mm. it will take a number of years mm. and do you remember we were once chatting to a chap there's lots of people listening might know of Choicea tenata the Mexican orange blossom and there's a lovely golden form called mm. Sundance that's been out for probably 30 40 years or more and we sat at a lunch once and we talked to the chap that introduced yeah, it yeah. Uh, is it peter 
Gad or something like that. And he is an English grower. He found it, he developed it and had plant breeders' rights on it. And, and you know, over the years, he's made quite a lot of money out of that. Yeah. So yeah. we need to look out for that unusual plant. Mm. Oh, we do. <laughs> <laughs> A quick reminder for people listening that if you've got a question for the team, just drop us an email, info at potsandtrials.com and all those details are in the show notes as usual. In fact, speaking of questions, I think we've had some future related ones. We have got we? one, haven't we? Yes, there's, uh, there's, there's certainly one. I think this is coming actually on YouTube. Yes, we have. Um, one of our American uh, listeners or viewers, should I say. Um, so really appreciate that we often put in Fahrenheit as, uh, and, as well as uh, Celsius in our references. Um, but they've got two yep. new fuchsia varieties that they're trying on the patio, Voodoo and Delta Sarah. Have you uh, come across those? No, I haven't, to mm. be fair. Uh, but there are thousands and thousands of different fuchsias, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. but... Um, just a quick query. Uh, somewhere they've read that you can eat the flowers. Is that true? And do they taste flowery? Um, I don't know about eating the flowers, to be fair. Um, I've never, ever come across that one. But I do know you can eat the seed pods. It's like a berry. So when the when the flower's finished, there's a, a green berry develops, it swells, and they ripen into a really sort of sort of deep, deep mm. red, almost oh, purple, like an aubergine colour. Yeah. Uh, and I, black, really. yeah, and they are edible and quite sweet. I've actually eaten some of those, and they 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 are very sweet and nice. And I know one or two people actually make jam out of them. So they they take them off and make mm. a jam just like you would a strawberry or a raspberry Somebody jam. Somebody gave us some, didn't they? They did at one of the ago. shows, and yeah. it's really tasty. It's nice, yeah. But as for the flower, I I don't really mm. know. And it's interesting with you saying you know thanking us for making reference to using Fahrenheit in inches, which are obviously used in uh, in America. But when I started my go art gardening career many many years ago we didn't use celsius or mm-hmm. metric then it was all fahrenheit and inches so we've changed haven't mm-hmm. we in, in the uk mm-hmm. i'm still yeah. by measurements I yeah. <laughs> well we seem to flip in and out depending uh, do you know what it's actually quite sensible if something is closer to sort of three inches it makes sense to use three inches if it's closer to 10 centimeters it makes sense to use 10 centimeters <laughs> yeah. assuming yeah. you can switch back and forth like that i suppose um, just on the subject of edible flowers, I, I did some Googling, so you should never always read what, okay. <laughs> believe what you read on the internet. No. But according to <laughs> flowersyoucaneat.com, uh, right. future flowers are edible. Yeah. Right. Um, so there you go. Yeah. But, I mean, they'd, look, they'd look pretty, wouldn't they? Scattered on a salad or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Apparently mm. they um, uh, are peppery. No, sorry. The leaves are peppery and the, sw- the flowers are subtly sweet and the berries are tart. But again, mm. never necessarily believe everything you read on the internet. Um, listen to yeah. a really trustworthy podcast. That's the best way. Yeah. To do it. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, we've uh, there was one other question on related to fuchsias that I spotted uh, one of our YouTube listeners, um, listeners or, or watchers or viewers on uh, the fuchsia masterclass video, which is a fantastic video where you spoke to a, um, a plant. Um, a future specialist, Martin, mm. if you remember back. Um, mm-hmm. they, there is somebody who's um, made a comment saying they're worried they've overpruned their fuchsia. They've said they've only left a few inches of branches and they're worried they might have to get a new plant. How resilient are the fuchsias uh, usually? Yeah, well, they are. And, and that would be when, we, of course, we spoke to Colleen Jones from uh, Ruellen Nurseries based in Wales. We spoke to them at one of the shows, who is an expert on fuchsias. And they are really, really tough and resilient. So you can pretty much cut them back to really hardwood to ground level. So if it's a hardy fuchsia that's in the garden, you can cut it down to ground level in spring and the new growth will come below. But if it's a a tender one that you're growing indoors or in a greenhouse, then in the spring, if you want to, you can cut it back so that you get that flush of new growth. If you don't, you get a woody base to them and that permanent base. But they are really tough. So I certainly don't think by cutting it hard back, you'll do any harm. After a few weeks, you'll start to see lots of little green buds. And then if you keep it watered and fed, it will burst into growth and it will still flower on that new wood. So I don't think you've done any harm at all. Fabulous. Oh, that's great. I'm sure they'll be pleased to hear that. And I'll uh, make sure that I respond on YouTube to say, listen to the podcast. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and uh, this is our usual regular weekly appeal for uh, um, any review. So if you've got two minutes to give us a review on um, whatever podcasting platform you, you use, please do. And uh, it helps us just reach a few more people. We're going to have some jobs in a little while. But first, let's go back to Barry and find out the secrets of, of being at Chelsea. <laughs> Chelsea. 
Barry, last year, 2023, was your first Chelsea Flower Show, which you do other shows. I've done shows for you know a number of years and created lovely exhibits, but to be invited to Chelsea must have been something quite special, I would have thought. Very much so. I mean, Chelsea is the total pinnacle of sort of a plant show's career. It's, it is the show. Some people say it's no different than any other show, but actually the bar's a lot higher than mm. any other show. Um, personally, I think so anyway. It's, um, everyone does the best effort for that show. Yeah, they do. Yeah. And, yeah. and wherever you go in the world, people have heard of the Chelsea yeah. Flower yeah. Show. Yeah. Uh, it's recognised. It is, yes. You say, yeah. So, you know, if you can say you've been an exhibitor at the Chelsea Flower Show, they know immediately yes, where you've where been. Where you are, yeah. So you did, a, you know, you, you do mainly herbaceous and I saw your display. It was wonderful. It was... Um, Thank you. It was, it was third week in May, but it looked like it was midsummer and, and it was just full of beautiful perennials in full growth lots of color lots of flower i mean what, what describe it more what was in it because it was it was that it was a quintessential cottage garden yeah it was sort of lupins delphiniums phylicterums there was cheglo in there which is like the purple leaf one area there was what else was in there there was gems yeah there's everything you could think of veronica's I'm struggling to think now, back I could have a picture in front of me. It was just full of, it was just it was full, just, wasn't Yeah, it? it was just all colour. I've looked back at some pictures and think, did I really produce that? And it was absolutely a riot of colour, yeah. which was fantastic to achieve yeah. in the sort of third week of May, but yeah. Well, I, really I, nice. I, as you know, judge at the Chelsea Flower Show. I didn't judge your stand, but it rightly got a very good award, didn't it? Yeah, we got a gold medal <laughs> with 12 points, and the judge was very complimentary towards us. Um, you know, she complimented on us leaf quality, plant quality and everything, said she couldn't even find a, bro a broken leaf in the display, which is sort of credit to all the team as, you know, as well. It was hard work getting everything ready and getting it there in one piece and me and the girl doing it, Jan putting it together, you know, just making sure everything was right. Yeah. And it was a bit of a rush towards the end. We ran out a little time on the Sunday. Um, I think it was about seven o'clock when we were putting the finishing touches mm -hmm. on, but, you know, we did it and, it's really pleasing when you do that. Yeah. And, no, it, yeah. it, it, it was amazing. And uh, as I say, I didn't judge you, but I saw it there. But I do a talk to garden clubs all around, garden clubs, and, you, and I do a talk on judging at Chelsea. And your <laughs> photograph of your garden is now as part of that talk. Lovely. As a, so, but as well as all the lovely flowers that you created in there, you also have your props in there. You'd got your little trademark hut that you had made especially for shows. Yes, we made a hut around a Danish trolley. It was made for my daughter's Wendy house. I brought her a Wendy house from a show many, many years ago and she'd grown up, so we took it down and used the timber to make, to sort of, it started off as a flower shop, um, then it's been bars, botanical brews, and all sorts. And then for, for Chelsea, we decided to be proud of his heritage. Um, all, I mean, all my staff come from Stoke-on-Trent, so we sort of tried to put potteries on the map and support the local people. So we had some bottle kilns made from steel to like make a silhouette in the display and made the hut into the potteries tea, tea shop, I think, or right, tea hut. Yes. Yeah, it was. Um, so it was all about the heritage of the bottle kilns and all the pot banks in, in Stoke-on-Trent. Um, so, you know, we're just on the outskirts but you can see all the bottle kilns, we can see Basil and where Wedwudge was and Real Dalton. Right, yeah. All them are like just the next hill yeah. over, so you know, it's mm. sort of part of it. And oh, a lot of my uncles and my father all worked in the pits to start the, their career to build the money to sort of start farming. So, you know, they they dug the coal to sort of f um, fuel the bottle kilns as well. Right, so yeah. it was all part it's of part it. Part of the heritage. Part of the heritage. Yeah. And, it is, and I and I would imagine getting a gold at Chelsea gets you quite a bit of publicity, and you know, because there's, there's a nice backstory from you having been a farmer as well. Isn't yeah, it? yeah, yeah, yeah. We got the, the BBC got wind of it and were very interested, and they filmed us. So they come and filmed us for I think it was four days almost. Um, they come once to get the background story and sort of see the farm and everything and all of it and sort of look around and then we did a day's filming sort of showing the farm and the nursery 
and everything about it. Then mm. they did another film when we were just starting putting the display together. Right. Which so is really nice. Exactly. So as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're at Harlow Car in uh, North Yorkshire at the moment. It's a bit windy actually, isn't it? Where it we're, is. sitting, we're sitting down at the end of a day uh, of the spring gardening weekend and, and it is a bit blowy. So if you can hear the wind, that's the reason why. Um, Chelsea is, I'm just trying to see what date it is. Chelsea's about five weeks away, I reckon, from now. Um, four yes. or five weeks. Chelsea is usually, isn't it, about the third week, third week uh, of May. Of May. Yeah. So it's not far away. And you're doing another display this year. Yeah, now, I don't want you to give too much away, but <laughs> presumably the plants are all waiting at the nursery or growing. Yeah, yeah, the plants are all growing. We've, we've probably had about seven or eight batches now to make sure some of the stuff is already in flower what we started in January because it's been quite mild and that sort of we had a bit of sunshine beginning of March so that really did sort of rally some did stuff you get on. Sunshine in March? A little bit. Yeah, yeah a little I, bit. I, I forgot what sunshine looked like. <laughs> um, yeah for a few days we did and it's amazing what 12 hours of sunshine or eight hours of sunshine can yeah. do so plants woke up very quickly and um, we've been encouraging them to grow and giving a bit of artificial heat and a bit of artificial light so they come on rather rapidly, so we've got more batches to follow on. Um, so, but there's loads of show, shows to go at, so yeah. they'll they'll come in somewhere or they'll go on the retail if they don't. Because I'm, they don't I'm make presuming the shows. you'll know roughly how many plants you want for your display, but you're going to have to go an awful lot more because some yeah. will have gone over, some won't be ready. Yeah. You'll have to pick the best one. Yeah, you? we probably grow four or five times more than we need for mm. Chelsea, just because we want everything perfect. Um, you're not going to travel all that way and make that effort if you don't want the highest highest medal you can get. Yeah. It's um, we try not to leave anything to chance. It's um, it was a big decision to do Chelsea because it's smack bang in the middle of what you would say is sort of bedding plant season. So the nurse is really busy and we're busy on production. So yeah. it's a long time for me to be away from home. So um, we want to come back with a, a, a real yeah. good medal. Um, and you know. Can we expect something similar? Is there a twist in there? Or you're not, you don't have to tell me, or, or you know. Yeah, I don't mind telling you. We've sort of revamped the hut again. It's um, it's going back to one of the old things we used to do. It's going to be like an old man's shed, as you would say. Yeah. It's um, typical cottage garden again. Yeah, lovely. But with the apt theme of educating people about bees. Right. To yes. a point. It's not actually educational, but it's just showing people, you know, bees are important and a lot of what you grow uh, the plants are really good for attracting pollinators anyway so yes. it fits in with what yeah. you're doing it on fits the what we're doing yeah. yeah so yeah so it's just a nice feature we like the features just to enhance the display yeah. it's yeah. Um, nice and subtle well all I'm, well I'm looking forward to seeing it I really am um, you know all the best with it I hope that the sun shines and the plants are all ready for Chelsea and yeah, fingers crossed. It, yeah. won't be, it won't be for lack of effort, that time no, I'll be exactly. off. Exactly, and we'll, uh, I'll, I'll try and catch up with you at Chelsea and, and we'll have a chat then. Lovely. Cheers, Martin. Thank, Thank you, you very Barry. much. Thank you. Cheers. Bye now. Bye. Oh, there's a scoop. Uh, all about mm. the bees. I think highlighting what, you know, the, the importance of pollinators has got to be a good thing, hasn't it? Yes, yes, definitely. I find it fascinating the way that you know that these nursery goers have to plan ahead you know a, at least a year and the fact that he's growing seven or eight batches of the same plants mm. so that they are at exactly the right moment to look mm. perfect on their stand it's on their display yeah because you know even though these are being grown in polytunnels the weather plays such an important role mm. and he can't tell what the weather's going to do so that's why he has to do several batches because if we get a very mild spell they'll be early if it's cold which we have had some cold weather the last few weeks here in the UK, things will be delayed. So by staggering the plantings, hopefully one of those batches will hit it perfectly yeah. for the Chelsea Flower yeah. Show. And that's yeah. the same for all the shows. And, and, you know, Barry's not alone. All the exhibitors, are at the, especially the early shows in the season when we're more reliant on the weather, they have to really juggle their crops and bring them into the cool and put them into warmth and do all sorts of things to, to get them perfect for judging. Because, you know, uh, when we do judge... 
we judge what we see. So we can't take into account the, oh, that would be lovely in a week's time. It's what it's like when we see it on the day. Mm. Yeah. And I, I was thinking um, how expensive that must be. But then, of course, they presumably sell those plants that are at different stages, right? Or hopefully they do. Some of them may be. Um, not all of them, because if, if he's not got a show a week or two before, and, and these aren't all sales plants, these are in bigger pots. So it's not his small pots that he'd be selling on his stand. These will be potted up, um, you know, last autumn to get them bigger for Chelsea so they, they probably won't go to waste they'll go somewhere but some of them will have gone over some will be used at the show and some will be ready in a couple of weeks time and he might be able to use those then on another show or another mm. event that he's going to mm. yeah. and you're judging at Chelsea aren't you yes I'll be judging at the Chelsea flower show so they think this is probably my I'm trying to work it out probably my 10th year at Chelsea judging there I don't judge Barry um, so there's absolutely no conflict of interest <laughs> I'm, I'm chairing a different judging panel so I tend to judge the uh, the tender plants so all the, the cacti and all the sort of lovely succulent and exotic plants and house plants mm. uh, with a panel of four other judges so but I shall definitely see Barry and pop in and have a chat with him to find out how he got on we and maybe need to do a future podcast on on the judging process oh yeah it's, be it's great. all about the gold isn't it but you know silver silver do they do silver gilt they as do well? so it it's goes gold. Gold, silver gilt, silver yeah, and a bronze. Right. Yes. So it's all about points. This is showing my complete ignorance. It's not like a race. It's like one person gets the gold, one person gets... You, you could potentially have multiple golds, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there are... I think... Um, I haven't seen the judging list yet, but I think Chelsea this year, there'll be probably 75 stands in the, the Great Pavilion, um, which is, you know, a posh marquee, essentially. Um, and in theory, if they're all good enough, they can all get gold. So there could be 75 golds. They won't be. So there'll be, a you know... a, a a, a number of golds, a number of silver gilt, silvers. We don't very often get bronzes. Yeah. You occasionally get one, but mm. so yes, it's yeah. a, you know there is no limit to how many golds there can be. And there's prize mm. money, presumably. There's prize money. It's gold. not a huge amount of prize no. money. In fairness, it's, they they it's get the honor some. Of getting it's, the it, it is medal, the isn't it? prestige value of saying Absolutely. you've got a gold yeah. medal. Um, and yeah. and Chelsea, all the RHS golds are of equal value. Um, so it doesn't matter which show they're at. They're all they're all judged on the same criteria. But I think Chelsea is probably the most prestigious show because it's known worldwide. So mm. if you can get one at Chelsea, it's special. Mm. And you're doing the judging on press day, aren't you? So yes, you we... get to see all sorts of people, don't you? I do. Yeah, don't give too much away, <laughs> otherwise we're all <laughs> special. But yes, Absolutely, we... Um, yeah. um, we, we, I go down on the Sunday um, when everything's being finished off. We judge on the Monday, so the show isn't open, but the press are in, uh, celebrities are in, uh, invited guests, and then the Royals come later on that afternoon. But we'll have finished judging by lunchtime. Well, we're going to be doing a podcast as a sort of catch up of Chelsea and catch up with Barry, aren't we? Oh, so yeah. we'll, we'll be able to hear all the gossip and oh, all, fantastic. all about fantastic. it. Fantastic. I've filmed at Chelsea a couple of times, and uh, yeah, you definitely, I mean, I. Name dropping aside, because I don't know these people, I just walk past them, but people like Ringo Starr and Damon Hill and, I mean, some amazing, you know, Joanna Lumley, they're just wandering around. <laughs> It's, it's yeah. a fabulous yes, experience. Yeah, they are. It, it is, yes. And, you know, and we're judging at the same time in the, the big floor marquee. So they just sort of, we have stewards. Come, Ringo, get out of the way, Ringo. I need to the way. We're judging. <laughs> yeah. yeah, clear <laughs> off. Yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so no, it's quite, it is bizarre. It but is it's, it's interesting because you see some celebs who are really, really keen gardeners and yeah. they are just really enjoying being there and chatting to the exhibitors. Yeah. And, mm. you know, they're making the most of being at Chelsea. And then they're there are some celebrities who are obviously there because it's press day and they want to you know, want get, the their, get their photos yeah. in the magazines as much That's, as they mm. can. So it's quite interesting spotting the difference between the two types. We'll get, get lots of pictures yeah. and we'll put some on our, our oh, Facebook fabulous. so people can fabulous. have a look on Instagram. Let's save some of Chelsea for, uh, <laughs> for a yeah. future mm. podcast. And uh, you got any jobs that we should be doing in the garden at the minute, Martin? Yeah, definitely. Um, it, it's you know, sort of getting going now. Once we get into May, hopefully we'll get some prolonged warmer weather because we've had some chilly weather over the last couple of weeks. And, but things are now starting to grow. But in the greenhouse, I'm going to be sowing my cucumbers. I, I never sow my cucumbers until... Um, may for the simple reason they like it warm and they hate fluctuating temperatures so you could sow them and it's warm in the day but then if it's dipping down to almost freezing at night they don't like it so by doing them now hopefully we get more 
constant temperature so I'll just do them in small pots um, and get those in the greenhouse on the propagator and they grow so quickly at this time of the year so uh, you can put your cucumber seed in but you can also do butternut squashes and ordinary squashes and courgettes if you haven't done them we've still got bags and bags of time to do all that you know right the way through till into June to be fair um, weeds are popping up so this is Mrs they Fisher's are. department because <laughs> you are chief weeder in our garden aren't you so yeah, get the hoe out. The hoe. We like to use a push hoe or a Dutch hoe. As soon as we see them in the borders, and because we've planted new beds and borders with shrubs and perennials, the soil's been disturbed. So we are getting those little seedling weeds. So pick a dry, sunny day and just chop them off at the surface before they grow. I did notice some of the ground elder that we thought we'd oh, managed right. to get most of it out. Or we have got a lot of it out, but there are some leaves popping up. Now I can't hoe those off, can mm, I? No, because they're a perennial and yeah. if you chop them off, the root will regrow. Whereas mm. the annual weeds, they you've chopped them off, they die. So what we need to do with those, or what, what I'm saying the royal we, we here, this is fish, <laughs> is just to, instead of chopping them off with a hoe, just get a little fork and just, the roots will come out yeah. easily because we've already turned the okay. soil over in the borders. Um, the perennials that we've planted and some in the front garden that have been in a year now are really getting going. Mm. So if you've got any tall ones that are prone to flopping over, now's the time to start getting your supports in, whether it's canes or these little frames that you buy that the perennials can grow through just to stop them so falling such as over. which one well i mean the the peonies are growing in mm. there we've got um some of the sort of michaelmas daisies asters are about a foot tall mm. so anything that's growing fast um that type of thing the okay. veronicastrums are all growing so it just gives them that little bit of support okay. um and then finally um we've got blueberries in pots because they need acid soil um, and they're growing, blossom on them, coming into leaves. So start to give them a feed. So we just give them a general liquid feed, seaweeds ideal, or if you've got a tomato fertilizer with the potash in it, it will just help them grow, but it will help the berries set and form for later in the year because we're still eating frozen I, blueberries. I was just going to say, yeah, they froze really well because they we had such a lot. They did so well, didn't mm. they, the blueberries? Um, so I just harvested them all, pop, pop them in the freezer, and we're just about coming to the end. So just don't, we've just been eating them to, um, some yogurt or, mm, or lo loads away just on your cereal in the morning there you go mm. so loads you can be doing in the garden at the moment it's a busy time excellent excellent well um, if you've got a specific question for the team drop us an email info at potsandtrails.com but that's probably about all we've got time for this week isn't it yeah okay. it is yeah but we'll be back again next week we will bye yep. bye, bye. bye. Watch the videos on YouTube or Facebook, follow us on Instagram, Twitter or X and subscribe to the podcast and never miss a thing. For more information, go to potsandtrials.com.